A very good morning to all of you. It is my joy and privilege to share the Word of God with you this morning. And I'm very thankful to Senior Pastor for the opportunity to do so. And this morning, my message is on thrust. Have you ever wondered why bad things happen to good people? Or to bring it a little closer home, have you ever asked why bad things happen to you? Some years back, in fact many years back, a well-meaning person gave me this book to read and it's entitled When Bad Things Happen to Good People and it's by Rabbi Harold Krishna. And this book was given to me at a time when an unfortunate incident happened to me. Uh, this was early in my working life and one day on the way back from an outstation work assignment, I met with a potentially fatal accident um, where the car turned turtle and the impact of the crash actually caused a fewer leak. By the mercies of God, my life and that of the, the graduate trainee who accompanied me were spared. Miraculously, we sustained minor bruises. The impact of the crash left a mark on the left-hand side of my face, and that was the shape of the sunglass I was wearing then. It took me ages, actually, to overcome the overwhelming fear and to be able to muster the courage to sit behind the wheel again. Uh, to complicate matters, the car was not mine. It belonged to a more senior staff who offered to loan her car for our work assignment. And sadly, I lost that friendship over the incident. And for the next few days after the accident, I was like a zombie. I was in a state of trauma and I could not think straight and couldn't make decisions. And the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, was, needless to say, hardly a help. I was actually more confused after reading it and I will elaborate on that a little further in a while's time. I didn't know what to do during that time except to throw myself literally at the throne of grace and mercy. God was gracious and he brought me through the storm. The firm bore part of the expenses and paid for paid first for all the expenses of the car repairs which came up to a very substantial amount and the repayment for the other half was deducted from my meager salary on a monthly basis what to do other than to tighten the belt that was already quite tight looking back i really didn't know how i went through that very challenging period i was in a Mental, I was in a state of mental and emotional turmoil. And um, it was quite a while before I came out of it. And yet, somewhere deep within, I knew that God's hand was in it. The very fact that I was alive and well was the, the evidence of His protection upon my life. And that gave me the assurance that He was with me. Even though I couldn't sense His presence, during that time, and my faith level really was at its lowest. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Amplified Bible put it, puts it this way, Now faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as a fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Faith is a conviction of the truth, the confidence of what is yet unseen. Faith requires no logical proof or material evidence. We often use faith and trust interchangeably. How different is faith from trust? Trust in this is an assured reliance on the character, 
ability, strength or truth of something or someone. And trust is largely based on the evidence and track record of the reliability of that person or that thing in question. We know we can trust someone to keep his or her word because of our past experience with him or her that gives us the assurance that he or she is worthy of our trust. Similarly, we can trust God because of our past experience of His faithfulness and trustworthiness. The psalmist David declares this in Psalm 9 verse 10, And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. In this psalm, David praises God for pleading his cause and giving him victory over his enemies who were plotting evil against him. In another psalm written by David, that is Psalm 28, where he began with a plea to God not to turn a deaf ear to him, but to listen to his cry for help, he then concluded with an expression of trust in the Lord based on his experience of God's faithfulness. Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. Faith is trusting God when we don't understand His ways. Faith surrenders all human reasoning and understanding to God because we recognize that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. When we look at the life of David, we will find that he has had more than his fair share of storms. From the time he was anointed as the next king of Israel as a teenager, it would be another 15 years before he finally ascended the throne. And during that period, he was on the run for many years from King Saul who tried to kill him. And there were times where he wrestled with feelings of despair, hopelessness, loneliness, and abandonment, as expressed in different psalms. And a good example is Psalm 13, where he expressed his anguish to the Lord in verses 1 and 2. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts, and day after day have sorrow in my heart? But as always, after recounting his troubles, he, he, he will conclude with an expression of trust in the Lord based on his experience of God's faithfulness. He never ceased to put his hope in the Lord, even in his darkest hour. He didn't allow his circumstances to stand in the way of his relationship with God. On the contrary, his trials and tribulations actually drove him toward God rather than away from God. And through it all, he had learned to wait patiently on the Lord and to trust God to bring to fulfillment the promises that he has made. What was the basis of David's trust and confidence in the Lord? Without a doubt, David knew his God. As a young shepherd, he had spent hours alone in the field with the Lord while tending his sheep. This was the time when he wrote many psalms of praises to the Lord. And David had learned to depend on God and to seek Him earnestly on a daily basis, moment by moment. He knew God's character and he knew who he was in God. The beginning of trust, therefore, is believing God is who He says He is. And in order for us to trust Him, there are three things we need to believe about God. And the first thing is this, God is completely sovereign. Secondly, He is perfect in His love. And thirdly, He is infinite in His wisdom. The common view in society when it comes to God and His relationship to suffering is that God is good but not all-powerful or he is powerful, but not all good. The book, 
given to me to read, which I mentioned earlier, when bad things happen to good people, took the standpoint that God is good, but He is not all-powerful. And the author, Rabbi Herod Krishna, came to this conclusion after wrestling with uh, many doubts and confusion following the diagnosis of his three-year-old son with a life-threatening degenerative disease. Sadly, his son died at the age of 14. And um, Krishna could not fathom why a good God would allow his son to die at such a young age. And to ease his own pain, he came up with this answer to the philosophical problem of pain and evil. And that is, God does his best and he is with his people in suffering, but he is not fully able to prevent it. He is limited in what he can do by laws of nature and by the evolution of human nature and human moral freedom. But when we look at it, right, this is not what the Bible teaches. Scriptures affirm that God is sovereign, He is all-powerful, and He is good. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35 says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? From this scripture, we can see that God does as he pleases. There is nothing that, that can occur in this world apart from his will. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 to 10, further affirms this truth that God has the absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. Let me read to you in the NLT version. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am good. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass for what I do, whatever I wish. Perhaps some may ask the question, if God is in control of all things, and he is in a position to do something about it, about the bad things that happen, why doesn't he? You know, when we ask this kind of question, this question presupposes that God is all-powerful, but he is not all good. Philip Hughes has this to say. He says that to question the goodness of God is to imply that man is more concerned about goodness than God is. And to suggest that man is kinder than God is to subvert the very nature of God. In the first place, where did we get our sense of justice and goodness if we were not from God himself, isn't it? If we finite beings who are prone to evil have this innate sense of justice and we want good to prevail, how much more the Creator, our Creator, who is infinite in all His ways, desire the good of His creation? And isn't that the very reason why He sent His Son Jesus? So that we fallen human beings would be delivered from evil and restored to wholeness. And when we are restored to wholeness, then we will not do evil or bring harm to another fellow human, isn't it? And that in a sense, and in that sense, there will be less pain and suffering. God is a good God, just as it is impossible in His very nature to be anything but perfectly holy, so it is impossible for Him to be anything but perfectly good. Psalm 119 verse 68 aptly puts it when it says of God, you are good and you do what is good. Not just some of the time, but you do good all the time. God's goodness is linked very closely to His perfection. And He is perfect in His love. God loves us not because we are good, but He loves us because He is good. His love for us is not based 
on our goodness because if it were based on our goodness, automatically all of us sitting here would be disqualified. Aren't we glad that God's love for us is based on His goodness? And out of His goodness, He has chosen to love us unconditionally in spite of our flaws, our shortcomings and our weaknesses. Romans 5 verse 8 tells us that but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still separated from Him and we were His enemies, Christ gave His life for us that we might be reconciled to God. If you want a convincing proof of God's love for us, I think Calvary is the most convincing evidence of God's love for us. 1 John 4, verse 9 to 10 says, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Roman, Romans 8, verse 32 says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Anytime we are tempted to doubt God's love, all we need to do is go back to the cross and reflect on what Christ has done for us. i just like to read to you an excerpt from the book, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts by the author Jerry Bridges. And he says this, he says, If God loved me enough to give his son to die for me when I was his enemy, surely he loves me enough to care for me now that I am his child. Having loved me to the ultimate extent at the cross, he cannot possibly fail to love me in my times of adversity. Having given such a priceless gift as his son, surely he will also give all else that is consistent with his glory and my good. So in a nutshell, what he's really saying is this. If God's love was sufficient for our greatest need, and that is our need for eternal salvation, surely it is sufficient for our lesser needs, the adversities that we encounter in life. Because there is no earthly adversity that can actually be compared with the awful calamity of being, of coming under the judgment of God and experiencing eternal separation from Him. So to recap, we can trust God because God is completely sovereign. He is perfect in His love. The greatest human love may sometimes fail us, but God's love for us will never fail. And we can see this very clearly in the story of the children of Israel. We see how many times they were so, oftentimes they were so stubborn in their ways. And because of their waywardness and disobedience, despite repeated counsel and warnings from the prophets of God, they continue in their sin of idolatry and rebellion. And consequently, the whole nation came under the judgment of God. But even in discipline, disciplining the nation severely, we can see that God never ceased to love His people. And amidst the bleakness of the situation that was brought upon by their own folly and disobedience, the prophet Jeremiah found hope in the unfailing love of God. And he says this in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 21 to 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This morning, if you are going through adversities because of your own folly and disobedience, know this, God's mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. 
And will you respond to His unfailing love and mercies by turning away from your sinful habits, from your sin, and resolutely making a decision to follow Him and to walk in His ways? And we come to our final point, and we can trust God because God is infinite in His wisdom. God in His infinite wisdom and perfect love will never discipline us, over-discipline us. He will never allow any adversity in our lives that is not ultimately for our good. And He uses the adversities of life to bring about the development of Christ-like character in us that would otherwise never occur in our lives without adversity. And the godly character traits that Paul mentions and which we call the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, can only be developed in the womb of adversity. But often, we shrink from adversity and we want God to snip the cocoon of adversity before our time, before its time. But God will never remove the adversity until we have profited from it and develop in whatever way He intended by, bring, by allowing us to go through that adversity. I mean, just like the cap caterpillar, right? If we snip its cocoon to help the butterfly emerge, we are actually doing more damage than good. We are actually preventing the butterfly from developing its muscles so that it would be able to survive in the next stage, in the next phase of life. And similarly, God knows what we need to develop our spiritual muscles and to transform our character. And that is why the Apostle James exhorts us to rejoice in our trials. He says in James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the, trusting, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. It is not the adversity itself that is to be the ground for our rejoicing, but rather it is the, expectations, it is the expectation of the results, the development of our character that should be the cause for us to rejoice in adversity. We rejoice because we believe that God is in control of our circumstances and He is at work in our circumstances, not to destroy us, but for our ultimate good. And what is this ultimate good? We often quote Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we associate it with God turning around bad things in our lives and making it work together for our good. But Note that our understanding of good is very different from God's definition of good because oftentimes we are seeing things from a human perspective. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance and He chose them to become like His Son so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. When we look at verse 29, it begins with the word for. And this indicates that it is a continuation or an application of the thought that is found in verse 28. For God knew His people in advance and He chose them to become like His Son so that His Son would become the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And I know for some people, when they read these words, the one thing, the first thing that jumps up to them is the concept of predestination. And they get so caught up with the argument about predestination and free will that they really fail to read the words for all its worth. Can I suggest to you this morning that we just don't read verse 28 as a stand alone, but we read <clears throat> verse 28 in the context of verse 
29 and take it for all it's worth. And I read it again, verse 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son, so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What is God's purpose for His people? God's purpose is for us to be conformed to the image and likeness of His Son. And this purpose goes all the way back to before. God knew us before we knew Him. And His purpose has always been that we should become like His Son, Jesus Christ. And it is not just for His glory, but it is also for our good. Because the more we become like Christ, the wiser we will become because then we will have the mind of Christ to be able to perceive God's pleasing, good and perfect will for our lives. The more we become like Christ, the more capable we are in overcoming the trials that come our way with the strength that He gives to us. The more we become like Christ, the more we will experience his unspeakable joy and His peace that surpasses all understanding. The more we become like Christ, the more we will do ministry His way and we will lead like Him. The more we become like Christ, the more we will love ourselves and the more we will love others. And I think you can make your own list. So from this verse, we can see that the ultimate good that God works for in our lives is conformity to the likeness of His Son, which is His purpose for us. The problem with us is that many times our own definition of good, mean, uh, of what good means, actually stands in the way of us experiencing God's best for our lives. We hang on so dearly to what we think is good, but and at the expense of the best that God wants to accomplish in our lives. We lose sight of the ultimate good that He wants to accomplish in our lives because we are so fixed on the good that He wants, we want Him to, to bring about in our lives. You see, at the end of the day, whatever good things or good outcomes we have enjoyed on this earth, they are only temporal, isn't it? The only thing that will last for eternity is the semblance that we bear to our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings here, the blessings that we enjoy here on earth is really a testimony of God's faithfulness to us. But what is the testimony of our faithfulness to God? What is the testimony of our faithfulness to God? Evidently, it is the Christ-like character we possess that testifies of our devotion and our commitment to the Lord. We become like the one we follow, isn't it? And it is to this end that God is still working in our lives, molding and shaping us to be like His Son and working in us what is pleasing to Him. Philippians 1 verse 6 gives us this assurance. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So in summary, we can trust God because he is who he says he is. He is completely sovereign over all the affairs of our life, our, the na our nation and our world. He is perfect in His love for all of us. His love for us is unfailing. We can trust that He only has our best interests in mind. And finally, we can trust Him because He is infinite in His wisdom and He knows what is best for us. So this morning, what challenges and difficulties are you going through? Will you bring that family need that financial need, your work situation, that spiritual battle, that relational conflict, that ministry challenge you are facing, 
and put your trust in this all-powerful, all-wise, and all-loving God. Trusting God at the end of the day is a matter of choice, is a matter of our will. It is easy to trust Him when things are going well, but when things are not going the way we expect it to, admittedly, it is not easy to trust Him. We can choose to be ruled by our feelings or we can choose to believe what the Word of God says about who God is. And if we are struggling to put our trust in God, we can always ask the Holy Spirit, our Divine Comforter, to help us, and I'm sure He will. I think perhaps our greatest struggle in trusting God is the fact that we are afraid that He may work things very differently from how we expect or what we want Him to do. But you know, because our human nature often wants to avoid pain and suffering. But trusting God does not mean that we will not experience pain and suffering. But we need to know this. It simply means that we believe that God is at work through the occasion of our pain for our ultimate good. And it is very important for us to recognize that trusting God is not just about experiencing peace amidst our difficulties or being delivered from our trials and tribulations. There is the honor of God that is at stake and this should be our chief concern. God is not a man that He should lie, but whatever He promises, He will bring to pass for His name's sake. And we do not question His trustworthiness. On the contrary, our primary response through His trustworthiness should be this, Lord, I trust You because You are the great I am that I am. The expression I am that I am is really a statement of incomparability. He is the eternal, unchanging, self-existent one, infinite and glorious in every way and above and beyond all created things. And when we look at the New Testament, interestingly, Jesus applies the title I am to himself. In the Gospel of John, we see seven I am statements that Jesus made. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true wine. Jesus is everything we need Him to be for us. But more than that, He is everything He says He is. He is who He says He is. So this morning, will you put your trust in who He says He is? The I am that I am, who is not only able to meet your needs, but who has a plan and purpose for your life, and who desires the ultimate good for us, and that is that we may be like His Son, Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you would bow your heads with me for a few moments and as you bow your heads, will you bring your concerns and your challenges to the great I am that I am and affirm your trust in Him by surrendering your will to His will. Just for a few moments, will you talk to the Lord? Will you bring all that concerns you Will you affirm your trust in Him? That He is completely sovereign. He is perfect in His love. And He is infinite in His wisdom.
would just like to pray for you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning we want to thank you for your unfailing love and faithfulness towards us. We acknowledge your sovereignty over all our affairs. And this morning, we come having the assurance that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine. We surrender our challenges, our struggles, our anxieties, our perplexities, our everything that we are fearful about, we bring it to you. You are the great I am that I am, in whom there is no comparison. Teach us to trust in you. Help us to be still and know that you are God and that you are the promise keeper. You are the way maker. You are the light in the darkness. And even when we can't feel it, and even when we can't see it, we know that you are working in our situation. But you are not just working in our situation, but you are also at the same time molding us and shaping us to be more like your son Jesus and you desire to bring about the ultimate good for our lives and so this morning we submit our will to your Lordship have your way in our lives let may you be glorified in every situation that we are faced with and may we be a testimony of your faithfulness and goodness in our lives that many more will come to know you and put their trust in you. Amen. For this we ask and we pray in the most precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.